Hi there. Okay. A little bit louder. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H. A, B, C, D, E, e F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, Q, R, S.
Okay, we should um, begin. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm from QT at the Faculty of Law uh, down under in Australia. Uh, as is always the case here at QT, I'd like to uh, pay my respects to begin with to Indigenous elders past, present, and future. Um, QT has always been uh, a place of Indigenous learning. Um, and here at QUT, we've been very interested in questions about Indigenous intellectual property. Uh, so recently, myself and a colleague, uh, Stephanie uh, Parkin, uh, appeared before the Australian Parliamentary Inquiry into the copyright um, protection in respect of the Aboriginal flag. And they have just handed down a big 120 page report on that particular topic. Over the next few days, I'm going to be giving a trilogy of talks about intellectual property and the coronavirus. And to start off the proceedings, I really want to talk about the Internet Archive, the National Emergency Library, and look at some of the tensions and conflicts that have arisen in relation to copyright law and the coronavirus. Uh, to give you a bit of background about myself, just to begin with, uh, initially, I kind of started out uh, a couple of de decades ago as a copyright specialist. Um, so I did my PhD back in the 1990s on copyright law and the creative industries. And since then, my interests have evolved in many different directions. I've kind of done quite a lot of work on IP and biotech and IP and access to medicines, um, as, as well as kind of delving into indigenous intellectual property and uh, some questions about intellectual property and new emerging technologies like 3D printing. Um, but the presentation today really represents a kind of a return to my first love in intellectual property of doing work on copyright law and thinking about some of its impacts upon education, access to knowledge uh, and access to information. Now, during the coronavirus uh, COVID-19 pandemic, many libraries, schools, and educational institutions have been shuttered during some of the lockdowns that have taken place um, around the world. Um, as a result, students, teachers, and communities have been left bereft over a lack of access to books. Uh, the Internet Archive um, sought to alleviate that problem in terms of a lack of access to uh, important cultural materials. Uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the Internet Archive, the Internet Archive is um, based in San Francisco um, in the uh, United States. Uh, the Internet Archive is a non-profit uh, digital library offering free universal access to books, movies and music, as well as archived web pages. Um, the Internet Archive has had some previous experience with copyright law. Um, the founder, Bruce DeKale, um, has been very kind of concerned about um, some of the uh, problems in respect of uh, libraries, archives and educational institutions and some of the copyright issues that they have faced. So in the past, uh, the Internet Archive has, for instance, challenged the copyright term extension that took place in the United States. Uh, the Internet Archive was particularly concerned about the problem of orphaned works where you could not find uh, the original uh, copyright owner. Uh, unfortunately for them, in the case of Kale versus Gonzalez, they were kind of unsuccessful in challenging the copyright term extension that took place. The Internet Archive has also been very interested in the nature and the scope of the defence of fair use, given some of its digitisation uh, activities. The Internet Archive has also been increasingly concerned about the use of takedown notices of archival material under the Digital Millennium uh, Copyright Act. Uh, the Internet Archive in many ways has been a kind of a champion and a defender of the public domain. Indeed, it kind of celebrated the reopening of the public domain with the expiry of copyright works whose life had been extended by the Sonny Bono Copyright Term Extension Act. So I guess this is important context to some of the battles 
that have broken out between uh, publishers and authors and the Internet Archive. Um, in the midst of the uh, coronavirus uh, epidemic, uh, the Internet Archive established a national emergency library. Um, this service was intended to provide a temporary collection of books that supported emergency remote teaching, research activities, independent scholarship and intellectual stimulation while universities, schools, training centres and libraries are closed. Uh, in response, uh, publishers uh, brought a copyright action against the Internet Archive, arguing that they had uh, been engaged in um, primary and secondary copyright infringement. Uh, and that has led to a kind of a larger debate about whether or not the National Emergency Library uh, was compliant or not uh, in respect of the copyright regime. Uh, so in my presentation today, I really want to kind of talk a little bit about the National Emergency Library, uh, consider some of the rhetorics and some of the complaints made by the publishers. Uh, I'd like to kind of explore some of the divisions that have kind of taken place within uh, the uh, communities of writers and authors. I think a really kind of fundamental question in terms of the dispute is whether or not the National Emergency Library is protected under the Defence of Fair Use in the United States. Uh, an equally kind of important question is uh, whether there is some sort of uh, protection offered in relation to controlled digital lending. Uh, the dispute also raises some larger questions about intermediary liability and the operation of safe harbours in the United States. And there has also, with the answer of the Internet Archive, been kind of ra questions raised about the first sale doctrine. Uh, there's going to be kind of important questions in terms of the operation of remedies in relation to the dispute and uh, whether or not the Internet Archive will be able to um, withstand uh, the kind of action um, brought by the uh, publishers. Uh, in response to the kind of conflict, the uh, Internet Archive has closed the National Emergency Library uh, early um, in a, an effort in partly to mollify the concerns of the copyright owners. I think there's a kind of a larger question about uh, what emergency powers might exist in relation to intellectual property flexibilities. Um, so in the field of patent law, we have become long used to kind of the questions about the use of patent flexibilities to provide access to essential medicines. Uh, and we have kind of relied in that context in relation to public licensing and patent pools and compulsory licensing uh, and a wide range of kind of other mechanisms to kind of provide access to patent inventions. I think the really interesting international part of the dispute over the National Emergency um, Library has been the uh, question about whether we need to kind of rethink some of our copyright flexibilities and limitations and exceptions in light of emergencies like the public health epidemic um, that has been presented by the coronavirus. Um, and indeed, uh, in the past week, uh, India and South Africa have uh, put forward a proposal to the TRIPS Council, uh, pushing for a waiver um, of the TRIPS agreement, not only in relation to the parts dealing with patents and designs, but also in relation to some of the copyright parts of the TRIPS agreement. So I think in terms of the larger international scope of the, the dispute, there is uh, an interesting kind of question about uh, how we might rethink our frameworks in relation to copyright law. Um, to, but to begin with, I just want to give you a kind of a quick little outline of the National Emergency Library um, so you, you can get a sense of its purpose and its role. Uh, Brewster Kale, as Digital Librarian of the Internet Archive, said this was our dream for the original internet coming to life, the library at everyone's fingertips. And the Internet Archive said that it kind of moved in internet speed to try to respond 
to uh, the shutdown in the United States of many cities and towns and communities and the closure of schools and libraries and universities uh, and kind of provide an array of material uh, to uh, deal with that sudden abrupt closure of some of the physical locations where one could kind of get those important cultural works. A range of libraries, universities and communities supported this initiative. So Chris Bird, for instance, who is the director of MIT Libraries um, and who was a keynote speaker uh, at the Creative Commons Summit a couple of years ago in Canada, kind of emphasised that in a global pandemic, robust digital lending options are key to a library's ability to care for staff and the community by allowing all of us to work remotely and maintain the recommended social distancing. Um, historian Jill Laporte praised the National Emergency Library observing if the books you need aren't in any bookstore and especially if you are one of the currently more than one billion students and teachers shut out of your classroom, please sign up, log on and borrow. Uh, the Internet Archive acknowledged that the National Emergency Library would not be a complete or a total solution to educational needs during the pandemic. Uh, it noted, we understand that we're not going to be able to meet everyone's needs. Our collection uh, at 1.4 million modern books is a fraction of the size of a large metropolitan library system or a great academic library. The Internet Archive noted that we offer digital access to books, many of which are otherwise unavailable to the public, while our schools and libraries are closed. And in addition, they kind of provided free access to 2.5 million fully downloadable public domain books. Uh, the Internet Archive were initially conscious that there would be an impact upon uh, authors and publishers. Um, the Internet Archive encouraged its users to uh, buy books. They said, we encourage all readers who are in a position to buy books to do so, ideally while also supporting your local bookshop. The Internet Archive was also wistfully hopeful that the National Emergency Library would be supported um, by authors and publishers and said, we hope that authors will support our effort to ensure temporary access to their work in this time of crisis. And it kind of emphasised that it would uh, expeditiously remove books if need be upon request from authors. And that the Internet Archive also commented that the National Emergency Library would be of limited duration. Um, they wanted to peg the uh, operation uh, of the regime to the duration of the US national emergency. In the meantime, the Internet Archive uh, hoped users all over the world have equal access to the books now available, regardless of their location. Uh, the Internet Archive was certainly not the only one to kind of provide such an emergency service. Um, there are a range of other kind of libraries and archives who increasingly offered their own services. The Internet Archive has kind of been providing an array of testimonials um, by users of the system. Uh, in some cases, it has been librarians who have been kind of helping health communities during the emergency. There have been testimonials um, from school kids and teachers. Uh, there's also been uh, testimonials from those who have been kind of lonely during the pandemic and needing to kind of get access to cultural works. In response, um, the publishers were very unsympathetic about the uh, introduction of the National Emergency Library. Uh, Maria Palente, uh, who was the uh, president and CEO of the Association of American Publishers, and the former head of the United States Copyright Office maintained, we are stunned by the Internet Archive's aggressive, unlawful and opportunistic attack on the rights of authors and publishers in the midst of the novel coronavirus pandemic. Uh, she insisted publishers are working tirelessly to support the public with numerous innovative and socially aware programs that address uh, every side of the crisis, providing free global access to research and medical journals that pertain to the virus, 
offering complementary digital education materials to schools and parents and expanding powerful storytelling platforms for readers of all ages. Uh, Palantir argued it is the height of hypocrisy that the Internet Archive is choosing this moment when lives, livelihoods and the economy are all in jeopardy to make a cynical play to undermine copyright. Um, her statements seem to try to depict the Internet Archive as some sort of villain acting in bad faith. Uh, this concern uh, was then uh, manifested further uh, with this lawsuit that was brought by several of the kind of larger um, multinational publishing uh, operations. So HarperCollins, Hatchet Book, John Wiley and Sons, and uh, Penguin Random House uh, brought a copyright action against the Internet Archive in respect of its open archive and the National Emergency Library. The lawsuit uh, alleged that the Internet Archive was engaged in willful mass copyright infringement. They said, without any license or any payment to authors or publishers, the Internet Archive scans print books, uploads these illegally scanned books to its services, and distributes verbatim digital copies of the books in whole via public-facing websites. Um, the lawsuit invokes the language of piracy. Um, despite the open library moniker, Internet uh, Archives actions grossly exceed legitimate library services, do violence to the Copyright Act, and constitute willful digital um, piracy on an industrial scale. Uh, they said that uh, the Internet Archives infringement is intentional and systematic, and it produces um, uh, mirror image copies of millions of unaltered in copyright works. So kind of really important to kind of note uh, how they heavily kind of draw upon the rhetoric of um, piracy in terms of framing the dispute. Um, the first cause of action is for direct copyright infringement. Uh, the second cause of action is for secondary copyright infringement under theories of contributory liability, inducement liability, drawing upon the MGM versus Grokster decision and vicarious uh, liability. Um, in terms of its prayer for relief, the publishers seek a declaration that the practices of the Internet Archive constitute willful copyright infringement. Uh, they have sought an injunction. They have sought uh, statutory uh, damages. Um, there's a whole cross-section of books kind of involved in the lawsuit. So at the kind of um, high end, there are uh, the works of Nobel Prize winners, uh, such as Toni Morrison in respect of her novel Song of Solomon, uh, Cormac McCarthy's The Road, J.D. Salinger's uh, The Catcher in the Rye. Uh, there's kind of popular works like um, James Corey's Caliban's War from the uh, science fiction series The Expanse, uh, Terry Pratchett's Night Watch, uh, C.S. Lewis's Narnia books, and some of the works of Lemony Snicket. Uh, there are also non-fiction works such as uh, Bill Bryson's A Short History of Nearly Everything, uh, Steve Silverman's Excellent History of Autism, Neurotribes, and the For Dummies series. Um, in the complaint, there is uh, an argument about the role of publishing and books in our culture and our system of democratic uh, self-government. Uh, and again, there's this kind of argument that the defendant opportunistically seized upon the COVID pandemic as an excuse to accomplish its long desired goals. So it's quite a hyperbolic complaint um, in many ways. For its part, the Internet Archive in its recent answer kind of denies such accusations. It says, contrary to the publisher's accusations, the Internet Archive and the hundreds of libraries and archives that support it are not pirates or thieves. They are librarians striving to serve their patrons online, just as they, uh, they have done for centuries in the brick and mortar world. Uh, the lawsuit um, from the publishers uh, has been um, supported in the media by the Authors Guild. Um, they have kind of argued, much like the publishers, uh, that uh, the Internet Archive is engaged in piracy hidden behind a sanctimonious veil of progressivism. Um, 
uh, and they have also tried to kind of question the status of the Internet Archive as a library. Um, so both Doug Preston and Mary Rosenberger um, have tried to frame the dispute in terms of authors' rights. Um, in terms of some of the individual authors, um, in certain circumstances, there has been some demurals from some of the claims made by the um, Authors Guild. So, for instance, um, Neil Gaiman um, has denied media reports that he supported the legal action versus the Internet Archive, and he has commented that I think a legal suit over that something that was obviously a well-intentioned effort to make things easier on people in the early days of the lockdown is wrong. Um, the Authors Alliance, for its part, has defended controlled digital lending. Um, it has said that it hasn't taken a position on the National Emergency Library, um, but nonetheless, it has urged publishers and others to recognise that this is an extraordinary time of emergency and that there is a need to be flexible about efforts to enable students, scholars and medical professionals and the shelter-in-place public to read. The dispute obviously is going to raise larger questions about the operation of the defence of fair use. In the United States, the defence of fair use has kind of been um, interpreted in a very uh, flexible fashion to support transformative uses of work, particularly in light of the uh, decision in the Pretty Woman case of Campbell versus A. Cuff Rose. Um, in the lawsuit, the publishers have argued that no concept of fair use supports the systematic mass copying or distribution of entire books for the purpose of mass reading. Uh, but it should be remembered that, you know, in the past, the Association of American Publishers and the Authors Guild um, sued Google over the Google um, Books project. And in that particular dispute, after some long-winded litigation, the Association of American Publishers reached a settlement and Justice Laval found in favour of Google um, and noted that the ultimate goal of copyright is to expand public knowledge and understanding. Um, and, you know, Google's uh, service, in his view, was kind of highly transformative. I mean, I think the president of the Authors Guild versus the Hathai Trust is also going to be a really important precedent that will um, have some bearing upon this litigation. Uh, you know, Bruce Vakale, in terms of his defence of the National Emergency Library, has um, said that the Fair Use Doctrine would help support um, the practices of the National Emergency Library. Um, and indeed, the answer in the affirmative um, defences of the Internet Archive says that the project serves the public interest in preservation, access and research, or classic fair use properties. Uh, and the Electronic Frontier Foundation and others have um, provided and led support for the National Emergency uh, Library. Not all kind of agree that it will be protected by fair use. So um, Professor James Grimmelman, for instance, has kind of questioned the prospects of the Internet Archive in terms of the dispute. Um, as an Australian, I think it's interesting to kind of contemplate how copyright exceptions will operate in other jurisdictions. You know, Australia only has a defence of fair dealing. Uh, many other jurisdictions around, around the world have um, purpose-specific defences. Uh, I think there are interesting questions about um, to what extent uh, something like the National Emergency Library would fare in other jurisdictions. So Sam Trousseau has kind of investigated the situation in Canada in relation to copyright law and fair dealing during the pandemic. Emily Hudson has done some interesting work on copyright exceptions um, in the United Kingdom. Um, Professor O'Dell from Trinity um, has looked at copyright exceptions in Ireland. The Communa Association kind of produced a really interesting report about um, the operation of copyright exceptions um, in uh, the European Union. There's also uh, intense debate in the litigation thus far over controlled digital lending and library exceptions. Uh, in the lawsuit, the publishers deny that the Internet Archive can rely upon lending privileges, and it says that the theory of controlled digital lending is a concocted or an invented theory that doesn't have a legislative base. 
whereas the Internet Archive is arguing to mirror traditional library lending online for everyone else, the Internet Archive allows patrons to bo um, borrow modern books um, through uh, the process of controlled digital lenders. So the Internet Archive have argued that controlled digital lending is merely an extension of um, some of the practices that libraries and archives engage in in terms of their physical activity. Um, and the Internet Archive has been supported by the Association of Research Libraries, um, Professor Pamela Samuelson from the University of California um, has mounted a defense of controlled digital life, uh, lending. Uh, public knowledge has kind of been also kind of quite interested in the, the topic as well. You know, if the Internet Archive lose the dispute, um, they have argued that there's a need for policymakers to support legislation clarifying the right of libraries to make print books available to patrons electronically. Uh, I've got five minutes left, so I might whistle through some of the other legal arguments raised in the dispute before wrapping up. Um, there's also a bit of a kind of a byplay over intermediary liability and safe harbours. Um, so the Internet Archive's defence includes safe harbour uh, as its fourth um, affirmative uh, defence, emphasising that to the extent that they arise by reason of the storage at the direction of the user of allegedly infringing material, the plaintiff's claims are barred in whole or in part. Um, and they kind of also know that all of the works at issue in this case have been removed from the Internet Archive's websites. Um, Republican Senator Tom Tillis from North Carolina wrote a letter to Bruce DeCale, um, amongst other things, raising issues about intermediary liability and saying that he wanted to revise the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. Um, there's been a lot of con controversy over the US uh, Copyright Office um, report, um, which seeks to kind of tilt intermediary liability um, further towards the interests of uh, copyright owners. As my colleague at QT, um, Nicholas Suzor has noted, there's been very kind of uneven regulation of internet intermediaries under copyright law. Um, so really the dispute is also kind of caught up in that larger controversy um, in respect of copyright law and intermediary liability. There's also kind of an argument about the doctrine of uh, first sale. So the Internet Archive is arguing that the plaintiff's claims are barred whole or in part by the first sale doctrine. There's a really interesting um, Supreme Court of the United States decision in Kurtzing versus John Wiley um, from 2013. Uh, in that case, the majority ruled that the first sale doctrine applied to copies of copyrighted work lawfully made abroad. Um, Breyer's leading judgment is really interesting in terms of it kind of uh, discussed at some length um, some of the arguments that have been made by libraries, including the American Library Association, about the first sale doctrine and how that was deeply embedded in the practices of libraries and booksellers and museums and retailers. And public knowledge, uh, the NGO group from uh, Washington, D.C., have been kind of very keen on this particular angle to the dispute and have argued that there should be an argument made in relation to um, the first sale. As I mentioned before, in terms of remedies, the publishers are arguing that there's willful copyright infringement. They've sought an injunction. They have sought statutory damages. Alternatively, they, they have argued an account of profits. The Internet Archive um, says that it shouldn't um, be liable for statutory damages because it believed and had reasonable grounds for believing that the accused use of the copyright work was a fair use, uh, including uh, in respect of the use by libraries. Um, they also have tried to make arguments about statute of limitations and um, that the various requests for remedies should be dismissed. Um, Bruce Sakai on the Internet Archive has responded to the litigation partly by closing the National Emergency Library um, early, even though there's still um, a pandemic racing through the United States in respect of the coronavirus. He has kind of pleaded with the publishers to settle the dispute in the boardroom rather than the courtroom. Um, 
uh, but nonetheless, he has kind of continued to try to maintain that libraries have the right to buy books and preserve them and lend them even in the digital world. And there's been a lot of concern that uh, the uh, library uh, could really be uh, destroyed um, by the litigation. Uh, just to wrap up, um, I think there are kind of larger important questions for the open access community over emergency powers in relation to intellectual property flexibilities during pandemics. Uh, the UN Secretary General's High Level Panel on Access to Medicines um, provided a really interesting template for uh, the use of intellectual property flexibilities to deal with public health. Um, and while it mainly dealt with patents, I think there are similar concerns in relation to copyright. Uh, Antonio Guterres and UNESCO and the United Nations have highlighted uh, the impact of the COVID pandemic upon education and learning and access to knowledge uh, and have emphasized that it has had a really severe impact. Uh, IFLA has written an open letter to WIPO on how IP law and practice should respond to COVID. Uh, and there's been a kind of a push for a new framework to think about the operation of copyright exceptions and limitations and flexibilities uh, during um, emergencies like the pandemic. Um, and as I mentioned um, previously, um, India and South Africa have put in a really interesting submission to the TRIPS Council, arguing for a waiver of parts of the TRIPS agreement to enable countries to better respond to the coronavirus. Not only do they want to waive in relation to patents and confidential information designs, but they also want to waive in relation to uh, matters in respect of copyright law. I'd just like to kind of conclude and kind of note that uh, really this is a kind of an opportunity for us to rethink and reimagine copyright law, uh, not only in terms of responding um, to the pandemic of the coronavirus, but also thinking ahead in terms of the um, recovery um, from the coronavirus. As the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres has noted, you know, we have a generational opportunity to reimagine education. We can take a leap towards forward looking systems that deliver quality education for all as a springboard for the infrastructure. And to achieve this, we need investment in digital literacy and infrastructure. And listening to that language by Antonio Guterres, I thought of the Internet Archive and the very important role that it has played during the pandemic. And I would argue that, you know, instead of shutting down the uh, Internet Archive, you know, perhaps we should think about the Internet Archive as a, a model that needs to be picked up and replicated um, in other jurisdictions. I think I'm at time there. I'll see there's a number of um, questions and queries in terms of the comments. Uh, just to answer a general kind of question that was made during the session, I will put some of the primary materials like the complaint um, of the publishers and the answer by the Internet Archive uh, up on the um, schedule site. Um, and I'll also try to put up a PDF of my slides as well. So thank you very much for your uh, time and your attention. I hope you have a wonderful uh, rest of the Creative Commons uh, Global Summit. Uh, and uh, hopefully this uh, beginning uh, talk um, can uh, help inform some of your further conversations throughout the uh, conference. Uh, because I am conscious that even though this is a US dispute, uh, there are lots of other um, parallel issues in other jurisdictions. You know, in Australia, we're very kind of concerned about the tyranny of distance. Our government is contemplating copyright um, reforms to help boost distance education and remote learning um, and online education. Um, and I think many other jurisdictions around the world are grappling with those sorts of issues. Um, so hopefully throughout the rest of the few days, you can take the opportunity to think about some of these issues and raise them in some of the other different jurisdictions and uh, regions that we're going to be looking at at the Creative Commons. Uh, have a wonderful uh, summer. Thank you very much.